Thank you. Hello and welcome to Southside Sunday School. I'm Joe Farless. I'll be uh, leading your lesson today. Thank you for being with us. We will be in the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke uh, today. Luke chapter 10, uh, beginning with verse 25 and uh, reading down through about verse 37. Um, maybe some other scripture uh, as well. But um, uh, we're going to be talking about today, or the point of the lesson is, uh, who is your neighbor? Who, who is your neighbor? You now, your immediate thoughts would go to the people beside you, next door to you. If you live in an apartment, it would be the people next door to you across the hall or something like that. Uh, if you live in a neighborhood, uh, it could be uh, as close as handshaking distance with open windows to um, uh, a mile or so down the road is your closest neighbor. Uh, but while when we think about that, um, we need to remember that the gospel hinges on um, us sharing the gospel with others, our neighbors being those others. And um, I know things aren't like they used to be. Yeah. Used to be, I'm, I mean, I'm old enough now to do, have done a lot of front porch sitting long, long time ago. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s when things were a little bit slower, a little bit simpler. Uh, we didn't have all the electronics that we do now, and certainly, not the, not, certainly not the cell phones. If you wanted to talk on the phone, you had to go inside where it was hot, and a lot of people didn't. So people walked up and down the street to get cool at night, and they sat out on their porches in swings and in chairs and rocking chairs. Uh, kids played in the yard, and we played a whole lot of kick can with our neighbors and you tended to know who your neighbors were and you tended to know who was what was going on with them uh, these days uh, social media has taken the place of face-to-face -face contact for the most part on, on facebook or twitter or something and you can be just as close with the people next door as you can be with somebody in uh, on other in other parts of the world I understand what I'm saying. Uh, sometimes we watch and we have um, the ability to maintain a certain uh, anonymity uh, that we don't get close to people anymore. Uh, we've uh, all but lost the art of effective communication uh, since we don't talk to a whole lot of people anymore. And, and uh, for the most part, it's, it's made it easy, uh, even shopping. We can pick up our items curbside if we want to. We can call it in, we can text our order in, or we can get on our computers and, and do it that way. And we don't have to talk with people. We don't have to interact with, with uh, people. So what does that do with the gospel? Hmm. What does that do with the gospel? It makes it hard to answer that question, who is your neighbor, doesn't it? I understand. But while we contemplate that and read the scripture, uh, let's ask God to open our hearts and our minds to receive his word. Let's join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, Father, for how you love us and how you, um, how you just deal with us each and every day. Father, it's a wonder that you do love us sometimes. We're so hard-headed. We... We're so uh, prideful. We're so selfish a whole lot of times, Father, that, uh, and, and we're so secluded. And a lot of times that's not by our doing. I mean, uh, it, a lot of times it is by our doing. So, Father, teach us. Teach us anew what you have in your Scripture today when we talk about uh, our neighbors, when we talk about sharing the Gospel and the importance of that one-on-one -on -one and personal relationships with people. Father, that we may fulfill uh, your um, great commission. Father, open our hearts and open our minds to receive your word and uh, make us better ambassadors uh, to serve you in our day-to-day -day life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
Um, love compels us to be the neighbors that others need us to be. Love. You heard me mention in our prayers uh, the fact sometimes that we are prideful, uh, that we're selfish, prideful of who we are, of what we have. Um, no matter how great or how small that amount is, our status, our position, and we're selfish. We're selfish with our time, we're selfish with our resources. Uh, we're selfish with the gospel a whole lot of the times. I'd like to read the opening statement uh, in our uh, Sunday School Quarterly uh, today. Um, it talks about um, how the Bible meets life. He said, uh, this one particular writer writes, Growing up in the McCoy household, I was known for being what I like to call domestically challenged. There was the time I folded and put away the dirty laundry, the time I put away dirty dishes thinking they were clean. Uh, I blame the far too thorough pre-rinse for that, they say. And the time I loaded the dishwasher with liquid dish soap, and well, you can guess what happened next. I was notorious for cleaning according to what my parents would inspect, but not necessarily what they would, uh, would not expect. Things look tidy on the outside. Just don't go opening any closets or drawers and don't look under the bed. What seemed neat and clean was often only surface level clean. Jesus got a response a lot like this when he told someone to love his neighbor as himself. And when the man heard it, his first response was to ask Jesus about actions God would inspect. Instead of about the heart, God expects. You and I can fall into the same mindset, and if we do, we not only miss one of the Lord's most important teachings, but we miss out on fulfilling our purpose. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 25 and reading down through verse 28, says this, Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked him. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. Parable of the Good Samaritan. Tells us. It's one of Jesus' most familiar stories, and it uh, tells us about an important detail. Jesus told this parable in response to a pointed question, and the man who asked Jesus this question was a Pharisee, an expert in the law. We usually think of the Pharisees and religious leaders in the Gospels as the villains of the New Testament because they were so antagonistic toward Jesus. We forget these men were considered to be among the most um, morally upright in the community. This man was a teacher, considered an expert in Scripture. He knew all about God's law. He even memorized uh, most of the Scripture. He said he com completely missed the point. And that's what Jesus was taking, talking to him about. His opening question tells us a lot. Teacher, what must I do? He was focused on outward actions, but the real purpose of the law was to show us that we can't do anything to be right or righteous with God any more than we can fly to the moon by ourselves. <laughs> law is meant to point us to a Savior beyond ourselves, and that's Jesus Christ. The very law this religious leader knew backwards and forwards should have led him to cry out to God for mercy, knowing that he could not possibly live up to God's perfect law and his standards for us, much less be worthy of eternal life with God. But this expert in the law still wanted to give it a shot. 
Jesus, in a method as old as the Garden of Eden, began to draw out the truth by questioning him. And of course, being an expert in the law that he was, the Pharisee answered correctly. He knew what was written, and he zeroed in on the commands that Jesus had identified earlier as the two greatest commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and uh, all, uh, all your soul. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the greatest and most important command. Now came the challenge. Jesus told him to obey the law. Do this and you will live. Knowing what God's word says matters little if we choose not to follow it. In fact, the more we know, the more responsible we are for obeying what we know. This religious leader knew very well that God's commandments required what? He knew very well what God's commandments required. He was responsible for obeying or not obeying. We continue on with verse 29, reading down through verse 22. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him and they beat him up and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the road when he saw him. He passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. See, this religious leader wanted to justify himself and be righteous in his own mind. And in his own life, his plan was to follow the law, which was impossible. And therefore, he wasn't looking for information when he asked, and who is my neighbor? He was looking for exoneration and acquittal. You certainly don't have to follow that command he was expecting to hear. All the righteousness that you have in memorizing the law and knowing the law and in, in being such a teacher that you instruct all of these around you should be enough. Truth is, his neighbor and our neighbor is not limited to those who live nearby. Our neighbor is every other human being. But what this expert in the law wanted to find was a way to get out of fully obeying. He wanted to know what Jesus would inspect to make sure he'd obeyed properly, not what Jesus would expect of his followers. He surely knew the scope of the command. Why else would he try to find a loophole in it? Try to find how he was, um, how, to, how he was doing. This expert in the law wanted to reduce God's command to something he could complete in his own power, not in the power of God. It was likely because he knew that loving a neighbor as ourself is impossible. I've often said that Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy is an impossibility for us. I jokingly referred to it for a long time. And the truth of the matter was that it's correct. It is an impossibility. In and of ourself, in our own power, it's an impossibility for love to be without hypocrisy. We can say that we love somebody. We can um, lavish them with gifts. We can, we can wait on them hand and foot. But it doesn't mean that we're loving. It means that we're serving. But it doesn't take care of the attitude doesn't take care of our deep thoughts. I've seen people serve other people grudgingly. They still serve them. They still serve them well. But they don't want to be there. They don't particularly like the person or the people that they're having to serve. And yet they do it. Possibly for money or position or power. Only God is good enough to love everyone, and only the love of God in our hearts can produce that love in us. You see, in and of ourselves, we're, in, we're incapable of doing that. But if we love in the power of Jesus Christ, through the help of the Holy Spirit, we can love without hypocrisy. We may, may not particularly care for the actions of the other people, 
But we can put those aside and we can love God. And we can love, and through that love, we love other people. Maybe a simple prayer for you right now is to, it would be to say, God, help me to love people, to see people as you see people. Not as how I can use them or how they could, uh, how they could benefit me. Not as objects for our own desires, but love them, to see them truly as God sees them. Wouldn't that be a change in your life? Well, it would certainly be a change in mine. Jesus' response to the man's question gets to the heart of God's law and shows the unbreakable connection between someone's true spiritual identity and how they treat others. The story was set in a familiar place with some familiar surroundings. The Jews didn't have, um, on that road from Jerusalem to Jericho, passed through Samaria. They did not like the Samaritans. They were too low um, in priority to really... Um, bother with the traveler in Jesus' parable was brutally beaten and left to die on the side of the road his only hope was for someone to help him enter the outwardly righteous people both the priest and the Levite were religious professionals you see priests offered sacrifices in the temple and Levites assisted the priest and had various duties in the temple But for all that, both men had in their hearts piousness. They were too important to bend down and to help someone. They knew their religious duties and they had knowledge of the law, but they utterly lacked mercy and com humanity and compassion. These leaders knew God's law, but they didn't know God. The one who knows God and loves him also loves his neighbor. And the one who loves his neighbor refuses to ignore that neighbor's needs. It's getting a little close, isn't it? Priest and Levite in Jesus' parable remind us that we too can become expert in God's words. In God's word. And yet fail to follow his ways. Maybe you know the Bible. Maybe you know it inside and out. I've had many, many discussions with people who can quote Scripture and use it as a blunt instrument to batter somebody else with a religious point of view, serving another denomination, serving in another denomination. The love of Christ wasn't in them at all. They knew the law. They were hard individuals. When we know God's law, we prove in our hearts what we profess with our mouth. Continuing on um, verse 33 and reading down through verse 37, still in uh, Luke chapter 10. But a Samaritan on his way, on his journey, came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. There it is. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. And then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took care of him all night. The next day, he took out two denarii. Gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three, Jesus said, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed him mercy, he said. Jesus told him to go and do the same. In every way, the Jews believed that they were superior to the Samaritans. And this was a shocking story to them. A good Jew would have had nothing to do with a Samaritan. So imagine the response of a Jewish religious leader when Jesus used a despised Samaritan as a hero of his story. But it hasn't say this the whole lesson. 
we face in our country, in our nation. Many struggles. COVID hadn't made it any easier. It separated us, segregated us, put us into little groups and were able to form an opinion and listen to people that probably uh, maybe we wouldn't have had as much to do with had it not been the fact that we were secluded at home with our own thoughts, unable to bounce it off of somebody with an opposition, so to speak, or with a, another viewpoint maybe a less radical viewpoint, we've become radicalized in our, um, just about every way of our life. It's not that we have two separate political parties in our nation, I know there's more. Two major political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Never in my life heard such hateful speech from one side to the other. It's not just a disagreement. These people want to completely destroy the other side because of their political views. The same is true for the racial tensions that we see in our nation these days. Yes, you may not agree with, with how somebody reacts to uh, what they consider an injustice. When was the last time you stepped over the line and extended a hand of friendship and here to listen? Compassion in your heart. Forgiveness. Acceptance. That's what Jesus was telling this Samaritan to do. Is there a people group that you just... Hate is a very, very strong word. But we do sometimes, don't we? Was Jesus trying just to get under this man's skin to cause him an irritation? Nah. Jesus was addressing the man's question. Who is my neighbor? Jesus turned the question around. He said, which of these three do you prove to be a neighbor? you think proved to be a neighbor to this man? True question is not who is my neighbor, but what kind of a neighbor am I? Of course, the true neighbor would be the one who took compassion on the man and took care of him all night and then took him to an end and made sure, made arrangements for his care. Even to the point of coming back and promising to pay an innkeeper for whatever more uh, that they had uh, a charge against him. A true neighbor was the man who fulfilled the heart of God's command and showed mercy. What risk do we take in loving others? Well, we risk the um, hmm. struggling for a word, but we risk um, others' interpretation of what we do. We risk being seen as somebody who loves or is identified with that political view or that uh, uh, personal view. Goodness knows that we don't want to see, be seen associating with, with the wrong people. Somebody may get the wrong idea. Jesus didn't care. He said, who is your neighbor? Jesus was unimpressed by this man's knowledge of the scripture. His outward professions of faith and uh, piety. He was concerned about the condition of his heart. After the religious leader acknowledged that it was the one who showed mercy was the true neighbor, Jesus told him to go and do the same thing. Put all your feelings in your back pocket and go help somebody. Listen to them. Find up their wounds. Be Jesus' hand of healing, his hand of compassion. 
See, Jesus touched lepers. He touched unclean people. The woman with an issue of blood understood how inadequate that she was and how, how she was looked upon as, uh, by others in the community. People avoided her, avoided touching her, avoided looking her way, avoided her in every way, physically, emotionally. She snuck up behind Jesus just to touch his garment. Power went out of him. Scriptures say, and he said, who touched me? You can see her on the street with her head bowed, not worthy to look up into the face of her Savior, with her hand outstretched. But she was healed. And he had compassion on her. And he showed the people around just exactly what he was all about. Touched the untouchable lepers. Handled them with compassion. He healed men who were lame. Those who could not walk. Who were confined to uh, a bed. Many of our church members are well rehearsed in God's word, but don't know how to follow his ways preoccupied with doing what God inspects and they don't have the heart that he expects I hope that's not you but I'll be honest with you I can't teach this message without thinking how many times I've failed and not just that is there any way that I'm failing now and just don't see it A lot of times we want our Sunday school lessons would be, we want our Sunday school lessons to be pats on the back. Something that would give us a rallying cry, something that would excite us, that would pump us up, make us sleep better at night. But this one's not that kind of lesson, folks. It's a heartfelt lesson that we all need to take to heart. And our world needs us so badly these days, so very badly. So won't you please, let your prayer be, God, help me to see people like you see them and to love them like Jesus loves them, loves them. We'll see a change in our hearts. We'll see a change in our world. I'll be right there with you with that prayer. You can count on that. But let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this lesson and we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Father, for this lesson in your word. And Father, how much we need it as a reminder. Father, a first time accusation. Or it's not one that we can sleep easily at night and just forget. Father, you bring it up to our hearts each and every time. So the next time, Father, we look upon someone with disgust, we look upon them with, with hatred or with uh, bad um, intentions, convict our hearts, Father, and help us to see them as you see them and love them as Jesus loves them. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for covering us with your mercy. Thank you for your grace. It's found in Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.